After all, we've gone from a flat, level, stupid site, according to Cram, the architect. Uh, we've lost some features in Harris County. We said that there's a plan afoot to create a new uh, uh, remnant of the gully, beautification, if you will. We have numerous animals that are present on the, uh, uh, on the campus. But I would submit, how can you, in this changing world, how can you create a university of the first order without upsetting the natural ecosystem? You know, we've got departments, we've got, we got folks, departments, and divisions here, uh, which nothing could take place if it had been a change. So perhaps we've changed our ecosystem. Maybe we've made a purse out of a sow's ear in terms of it. I'm not concerned about the changes that have occurred. Uh, it, it occurs everywhere. And I think I've probably given you enough of uh, uh, examples tonight of things that have overcome these particular changes, or at least I hope I have. Now, I've purposely not included two events in this, which are of national, international, and local interest. And that's uh, BSE, or mad cow disease, and hoof and mouth disease. Now, there's no one at this campus that's working on those. But I think everyone's interested, and if there, if there is any questions uh, uh, that you have, uh, as I conclude, I will give you a, I'll try to give them a go on that. Because there's interesting corollaries that hit us here at home in both of those. But I think I've talked long enough. My voice is getting a little weak. Thank you for your patience, your kindness. I've enjoyed talking with you. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Question, John. Okay. Decline or wilt. So, yeah. Boy, John, I tell you, I wish you were in all my lectures because I can answer one, at least one of those. <laughs> the, uh, the ball moss that you see is a epiphyte. It belongs in the same group with orchids. Uh, it's a close relative, in fact, in the same genus as a Spanish moss. The genus is Tillandsia. I can't remember the name of the species. It's an interesting, I have some interest in that. If my time doesn't run out, life included, uh, I may do some work on this. Uh, both of these are epiphytes. That is, they are not parasitic, like dodder, mistletoe, and things, which take some of their energy out of the plant, uh, uh, being a hemiparasite or a full parasite. So they collect nutrients, wind blowing dust, uh, moisture, and the dust has minerals, and they survive on that. Uh, the interesting thing is, as you, not so, to some degree, in the Bradshaw's, Mary Bradshaw's front yard, there's a tree that's really suffering from this. Now, that's almost an oxymoron if you say an epiphyte is going to kill something. But if you go to the hill country, there are post oaks and live oaks over there that are essentially dying because there is so much shade created from this. And also, if you get down and take a hand lens, there are rootlets on that thing that are actually penetrating a plant. Now, I don't know whether they intercept the xylem and phloem to get nutrients out of it or not, but I don't think people have looked at that enough. There is some penetration on that. It's also said that if you use copper salt, and I'm not gonna mention any trade names, that you can spray them with that, and that'll kill them. In the hill country, they go on cropper, telephone wires, and everything else. That doesn't sound like that's too an effective treatment if they grow on copper wires and on gutters and things like this. But it is a problem, especially on the walkway between uh, Sewell, next building. Uh, a lot of those trees are really covered with it. Uh, there are probably some selective herbicides that you could put on those, John, that would uh, do them in. I'm not familiar with that, but it's... 
Well, the other thing that you can do is uh, they could actually shake them off. They're not highly attached. You can, they could shake the veg uh, and drop a lot of these off. They have to do that when they're not producing seeds because they're just going to exacerbate the, uh, the problem if they do it when they're in flower as they are right now. So it'd be best to do them before they come to flower, maybe last, uh, uh, last fall uh, when that was done. Uh, so that's an interesting thing. It's a, it, it shouldn't kill trees, but it does uh, by some means. And it may have some compound that is produced, and this is a process that is referred to as allelopathy, that the plant produces a compound which pre prevents growth of the other plant. How many people are familiar with the black walnut? Don't have too many of them here. Big, heavy fruit, stains your hands, uh, gets all over you. It produces a compound, and no other forb will grow under those trees. Grasses will grow, but it prevents other trees. And that, that's another thing that this Tillandsia may be doing. It may be producing something that's, uh, that's affecting, affecting a tree, because it'll grow on dead trees as well as live trees. It doesn't make any difference. The second part of your question is live oak decline and, uh, or, uh, or oak wilt. And I hate to admit it, but there's been a lot of bad information disseminated on this, or at least in my mind it has. It's caused by a fungal organism in the same genus that caused the demise of the great elm trees in the east, Dutch elm disease. It's spread by beetles, by wounds on trees, by tree trimmers, contaminated chainsaws, saws, things like this. Uh, in both the elm and the live oak, it works by essentially the fungus plugs up the sap conducting systems and death occurs. It's really a parasite that is probably better known in the red oaks, reds, schumards, blackjack, in that group. Do you know the difference between a red oak and a white oak? Well, you know, if the leaf has pointy ends on it, it's a red oak. It belongs in that general classification. If it's got rounded lobes on it, it's a white oak. Willows, live, uh, water are in the, in the white oak group. And so it's primarily carried in the red oaks. And they live longer, but it's more dangerous in live oaks. And it's more dangerous in live oaks because live oaks have a propensity for root grafting. Now think of the campus. That is, the roots from this tree graft to this one. They graft to this one. They graft to this one. You get an infected tree over here. It's like a zipper. It goes right down, infecting all of the trees. Uh, does it occur here? Not often. It's occurred in some of the red oaks in, this, in the county. Uh, the biggest concern I think that I have over it uh, is the fact of using wood, oak wood from the hill country, where this is rampant, uh, and bringing it in and using it for firewood. You not only import beetles, but you import the fungus. And as the fire starts, a lot of fungal spores will go out the chimney unscathed by the temperature before it really gets hot, and that could infect, uh, infect trees through wounds and things of that nature. Uh, so I'm not evoking a, a moratorium, a, a band or tariff on oak wood, but I think you have to be careful uh, with that. Uh, the, uh, the practice of curing it and preventing this root grafting in the hill country is to trench between trees. Fredericksburg lost almost all of their oak trees before they found out that they could take a ditch witch and go in and circle a tree and break the graft to the next tree. Uh, but the soil at Fredericksburg is only about this deep. If we get into this gumbo type soil that we have, this Lake Charles clay that we have down here, those roots go considerably deeper. The, the trench may be up to here and be prohibitively expensive. There's been some concern with the the method on the campus of planting nothing but, but live oaks. Uh, and if, a disease, if an epidemic does get started, it'll be disastrous on the campus. It, 
but they grow fast and they can be replaced. That's what I, that's what people tell me in buildings and grounds. Uh, so far, we haven't had a serious epidemic of that. The hill country. The other thing that exacerbates this is heat or is water stress. Certainly, the last two summers have set us up for something. Now we're caught up whether the trees got stressed enough to have that. I don't know. Uh, but thank you for those questions. Yes. I'm laughing. I'm not laughing at this. I'm laughing at, at the Rice Prairie, uh, which has been a sore point in my line. You know, out uh, along Rice Boulevard, there's a cyclone fence that was set up as a prairie. And it took seven years for us to kill the damn banana trees in it. And bananas are not a normal component of southern prairies uh, by any means. Uh, I grew up in a, on a farm. And uh, I'm a biologist, not necessarily an ecologist. And I said, if you want to start a prairie, you go in and sterilize that. You round up the devil out of that. You kill everything that you can kill in it. And then you start out with seed. And you put what you want in it, and it'll, it'll come up. Uh, powers that be thought of a difference, and it hasn't worked out quite the well they, as well as they anticipated. The Tapley project, I've talked a lot with uh, Mr. Tapley in that, and it would be nice to have uh, plant communities that are reminiscent uh, of those that we have had on that part of the campus and still have. If you're familiar with that area behind the, uh, to the east of the track stadium, there's several rows of oak trees over there. There's water willow. Uh, maybe maybe there's a couple of straggly post oaks. Uh, there to build on that as a uh, uh, you've got to, a canopy started. Certainly, if you're going to have ponded water, uh, cypress and ball cypress and tupelo are normally uh, did occur on Harris Gulch. Cedar elm is another one. Uh, there's a whole cadre of of plants, of woody plants, trees that fall into that. One would hope also that that would have a uh, uh, standing water. When you start talking about standing water, uh, people in urban committees really get goosey. They think, you know, uh, water spontaneously generates mosquitoes. Uh, well, most of our mosquitoes actually come out of storm sewers. Uh, there's a large number of them hatch out on the, on the prairie out there, and it's wet, and those short-cycled ones. Uh, but if you've got standing water, you've always got critters in there that eat mosquitoes. So the worst place you can have them are in the storm sewers, where there's nothing much else in there other than so, some roof rats and raccoons and opossums that live there. Uh, but there's no fish population to take care of them. If you have standing water, you can have gambusiids, uh, mosquito fish, and everything that would take care of that. And, and with that, you could uh, stay with the na native uh, cadre of plants, uh, crinum, uh, spider lilies, hamarocallus, uh, same as a daylily genus, uh, and things of that nature. Uh, the, the architecture of any standing water has to be carefully adjusted so that you, you got a little bit of riparian fluctuating and then it gets deep. If you don't have that, the whole pond becomes taken over by uh, emergent vegetation. So. Some care has to be gone into that, but there's enough of us around that know something about that to uh, control uh, that. And I think, again, as you do that, uh, and you provide some water over there, you put up a few nesting boxes, you're going to have wood ducks, you're going to have the fulvous whistling duck uh, that's going to take place of it, you're going to have the night herons will probably move away from the present swimming pool over there. Uh, uh, he'd be elated over that. Uh, although I haven't consulted with him on that. But, uh, uh, so uh, build a habitat, and it's, it's like the cornfield. Uh, <laughs> they will come. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, pardon me. Yes? Other than the cage variety, have there ever been any owls? Yes. We've had... Uh, what we need are more holes, and we need greater access to uh, things. Uh, the uh, tower on the old chemistry building 
in the attic in the old chemistry building, which is now Keck Hall, it's been all fluffed up, and I know they've plugged up all the holes. It used to have barn owls in it, uh, one that gets along well with uh, uh, humans. Screech owls have always been on campus, uh, in fact, on TSU campus. Campus, U of H campus. The only shortage they have are enough roosting, uh, nesting holes for them. But a, a wood duck box, which is a cedar box about so so big with a hole in it about that big, would be taken over by those. Uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, screech owls in Southampton over here because we have old patent trees that limbs have fallen off and they got hollows in them. It's a good nesting uh, place. So uh, the more habitat you can provide like that. I'm a strong advocate of uh, you find a tree with a huge pileated woodpecker hole in it in the, in the big thicket, cut the thing, you know, and the tree's falling over, cut it off and bring a piece down and you strapping and put it up on the tree. Makes a beautiful birdhouse. Uh, for that. But uh, we have, we've had great horn owls on, on the campus. Uh, as far as the raptors go, the hawks, uh, uh, red-tailed, red-shouldered, uh, coopers, and right now we need more owls than hawks uh, because we're up to our gills in uh, uh, rock pigeons or uh, rock doves or pigeons right now. We've uh, we've created a lot of buildings that have ledges and access to under the eaves, and the pigeon population is burgeoning. Uh, I've been trying to get this done because there are some health effects that we need to worry about with that. Uh, uh, so you're going to start a campaign to save the owls? Uh, I'd rather have them out than I would in a cage. There's an interesting story. I used to have a, I had a federal and a state collecting permit. There wasn't a bird that wasn't on endangered or threatened that I couldn't collect for research that we were doing. And all of a sudden, I noticed we had this owl cage on the campus. And I was renewing my state permit and somehow that owl got on my permit. And I don't remember whether I hallucinated and told someone it was all right or whether there was a Rice graduate who was an attorney at Parks and Wildlife. And I think that scamp is the one that needed trying to help out some of his buddies and snuck it in on my permit. Well, I was in total violation of them because they were taking it, you know, to football games and everything. And it was supposed to be in, in the cage being fed mice and for scientific uh, and educational purposes. And this thing was being flaunted around at football games and transported to Texas Tech and everywhere else. <laughs> so uh, I had it eradicated from my permit. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, they, I'd rather see them in, uh, in the wild than I would uh, in cage. Although there is a good rehabilitation program here in, in Houston, and uh, and I have to admit the students did take good care of those. Other than the fact that some cats uh, got into the cage, and that's something to be expected uh, if you don't take good care of them. Uh, cats or dogs uh, got in. Uh, well, thank you very, very, very much. Enjoyed it. Thank you.